well, in the uh, follow-up, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, a number of philosophical issues connected uh, with this. Uh, and all of this is going to be, in some sense, uh, connected to Paul Bernays' philosophy of mathematics. Um, uh, so very briefly, uh, Cantor introduced the, the ordinal numbers, uh, whose totality he signified with a large omega, uh, as the order types of well-ordered sets. And in axiomatic set theory, one usually represents these by the transitive epsilon well-ordered sets. This would be the von Neumann ordinals. Uh, the notion of cardinality, I presume, is um, well known. Um, two sets have the same cardinality if there is a bijection between them. Um, and the cardinal numbers, the, the Alephs, um, in some sense represent the bijection types of sets. And they usually get uh, represented by ordinals uh, within set theory. Uh, now, Cantor proved um, that for any cardinal uh, kappa, the uh, cardinality of the power set of kappa is strictly larger uh, than kappa itself. And uh, together with um, uh, the proof that uh, the, the, the cardinals are uh, linear order, so all cardinals are comparable, or all cardinal the cardinality of all sets are comparable on the assumption of the axiom of choice, which in this context is uh, a reasonable assumption. Um, the, the, the natural question one would ask uh, immediately is then how does the cardinality of the continuum and the cardinality of the natural number relate and the well-known uh, continuum hypothesis is that Aleph 1, so the cardinality of the countable ordinals equals the cardinality of um, the power set of the natural numbers, but yeah, so in other words, the totality of real numbers. Um, now this result or this hypothesis turned out to be extremely difficult to prove for a very deep reason, namely that it is in fact independent from the customary axioms of uh, set theory. Uh, so Gödel proved in uh, well, 1939, 1940, the uh, consistency of the continuum hypothesis relative to the axioms of uh, first order set theory. Um, and this proof strategy was essentially to construct an inner model, um, the constructible hierarchy L, uh, in which the continuum hypothesis would be true. So on the assumption that set F1 is consistent, uh, the continuum hypothesis is consistent. And Paul Cohen proved the companion results uh, more than 20 years later, um, showing that if um, semi Franco uh, set theory uh, first order is consistent, then also the negation of the continuum hypothesis is consistent with it. And the strategy here was to what one could call the construction of an outer model, or outer models, which one gets by adjoining to a ground model M, a new generic set G, uh, which allows us to obtain a transitive model MG. And uh, if we if we vary the, the, the conditions um, uh, in um, M approximating G, then we can essentially make the continuum hypothesis come out any way we like. So it has been likened to switching it on and off, uh, similarly to an, a light switch. Um, now there's a today quite uh, prominent interpretation of this, uh, which in fact has already been um, proposed uh, right after Cohen proved his result. Um, but I'm going to use uh, Joel Hampkins here as the proponent, the sort of prototypical proponent, proponent of this view. Um, the multiverse view, which essentially says that, um, I'm going to quote here, the most prominent phenomenon in set theory has been the discovery of a shocking diversity of set theoretic possibilities. Our most powerful set theoretic tools, uh, such as forcing ultra powers and canonical inner models, are most naturally and directly understood as methods of constructing alternative set theoretic universes. Um, and then he goes on uh, quoting a lot of examples, um, which essentially uh, just illustrate the point that uh, a set theorist can build uh, essentially any model uh, that, that he or she wants um, using these set theoret uh, model theoretic tools. Um, and as a result of this, uh, he said, uh, the fundamental objects of study in set theory have become the models of set theory itself. Um, set theorists move with agility from one model to another in quite the same way that group theorists study group, ring theorists study rings, and topologists study topological spaces, set theorists uh, study the models of set theory. So the idea is here that uh, set theory becomes um, something analogous to um, an algebraic theory, 
where we do not have one intended structure to be described, that we have a wide variety of different um, non-isomorphic structures. And uh, there's not one determinate universe of sets, so to speak. Um, and in particular, uh, Hamkins uh, continues, the question of the continuum hypothesis is settled on this view, um, namely in the sense that it does not have a determinate truth value. Um, it cannot no longer be settled in the way by introducing new, ax new axioms that would decide it, um, but rather we have such extensive knowledge of all these different universes or worlds, some of which is true and some of which is false, that that is in a sense the, the best that we can hope for. And there's no hope for settling it in some canonical way. Uh, now I want to contrast this with another well-known result, uh, also in the meta theory of set theory, um, which uh, results when we move to a higher order uh, framework. Um, so we're going to, for now, look at a set theory couched in second order logic, but we will later um, go to another framework again. Uh, but for now, um, we look at uh, essentially the Zemelov-Venko axioms um, without the axiom of infinity uh, within uh, second order logic. So we now do not have um, a separation schema and uh, replacement schema, but we have the full second order axioms. And another uh, restriction is that we only regard so-called full models, so we don't uh, consider Henkin models. Um, and for this uh, theory, we can state a uh, result that um, counteracts in some sense or is a, is a, a counterpoint to uh, the previously discussed independence results, namely we have a kind of quasi-categoricity. Um, namely that for any two models um, um, of this theory, they are either isomorphic to each other or one is isomorphic to an initial segment of uh, the other. And um, as a consequence of this, uh, if we add any axiom of infinity, uh, we have the semantic determinacy of the continuum hypothesis, which is to say it is true, um, either it is true in all models or it is false in all models. And so um, this has been described um, as providing us with a disanalogy to um, the algebraic case and also the case uh, in geometry. So Georg Kreisel has famously um, drawn attention to the fact that uh, on this account, the continuum hypothesis is not a direct analog of the parallel postulate um, because the parallel postulate is independent from the other axioms uh, of geometry, even in a second order context. Whereas the continuum hypothesis is uh, not independent in a second order context. So one could better like, liken it to um, the, uh, uh, the, the problem of squaring the circle, which of course is not possible in the context of um, Euclidean geometry, but that doesn't mean that there is no solution to the problem of constructing a square that has a uh, side length pi. So it's a matter of which instruments we use and not so much a matter of this being indete uh, indeterminate. Um, but now, this uh, particular uh, way of approaching the problem uh, is open to a rather uh, striking uh, criticism. Um, framework. Why are we allowed to make reference to uh, second order logic uh, in this context? And uh, Hamkins uh, and Solberg uh, in particular have um, presented this um, objection and I'm going to quote here again. So the question is uh, what it means to have an, the point is that what it means to have an interpretation of second order logic uh, is that one has essentially fixed a meta theoretic set theoretic background. And if one were to treat the set theoretic background as an object theoretic model of set theory, which is to say, if one were to take that set theoretic background seriously as a model of set theory, then what was previously the external conception of categoristic becomes an internal notion. Um, so the point is that if we move from the object level to the meta level, 
then um, we can again ask uh, the question uh, uh, there. So um, maybe I, I should, I'm going to come back to this later and go straight to this one. Uh, so uh, the point of the criticism is essentially the following. Um, we have for every, every meta theory, uh, the dichotomy that either the meta theory is itself semantically incomplete. So uh, the interpretation that we give for the second order quantifiers is in terms of a set um, similar Frankel set theory in first order in the meta theory or else it is complete. But in that case, we're just begging the question. So um, the point here is that the definite uh, the definitiveness of the object theory, a set concept can't be established by appealing to um, the definitiveness of the meta theory, set concept, essentially, which is shifting um, the objection from the object theory to the meta theory without ever answering it. And so uh, they would say, if someone says that our concept of set is, defi is definite and complete because they have a categorical account of it in second order logic, um, then we would simply want to know why the meta theoretic concept of set is definite and complete. So it doesn't really solve anything. But now I want to come back to a point um, that, that was already mentioned earlier. Um, and that is that uh, for uh, Hamkins, uh, the fundamental object of study in set theory um, are the models of set theory. So essentially what he's saying is that set theory becomes just a form of model theory. And this, uh, I would argue, uh, is false. And this would allow us also to uh, come to a um, a more um, appropriate understanding of the quasi categories of two results, as I try to argue now. Um, so, firstly, I would like to emphasize that it is important to make a distinction between model theory on the one hand and um, semantics in an informal sense, in a sense of meaning theory or a theory of understanding. So, model theory uh, studies the relationship between formal systems, syntactic objects and structures, which are set theoretic objects, and is in that sense completely internal to mathematics, right? I mean, both of them are essentially mathematical structures are described with mathematical means. And I'm then in that sense, completely internal to mathematics. And if we want to try and give an account of, so to speak, the meaning of mathematical language, it doesn't really help us providing a model theoretic interpretation because then one will simply ask, okay, but what does that mean then? So this is again just pushing the problem to the meta level. Um, and uh, if I say rejection of the model theoretic picture, this is in no, me, uh, in no way meant as a criticism of model theory as a mathematical discipline, quite the contrary. Um, but the, the point is here, and this, has, this point has been made uh, variously by Michael Dammit, uh, Hilary Putnam, uh, William Tate, and also Paul Bernays in one sense, um, that mathematics itself uh, it's not, should not be considered as an object theory that is in need of an interpretation, a kind of external interpretation, where interpretation is meant in the sense of model theory. Um, and Paul Bernays has emphasized uh, this point by saying that mathematics as a whole is not a structure and is also not isomorphic to a structure. And um, the, the point here corresponds to an idea that was sketched um, already by Zermelo in the 1930s. Uh, namely the point that um, the universe of sets is itself not a mathematical object. And it's in that sense also not um, supposed to be understood in the, in the way we understand models, but rather it is in some, well, for Zemelo it was, uh, we have a kind of ascending sequence of um, models of set theory, but we do not have um, V as uh, the, the universe of all sets that can be considered itself an object of mathematical uh, study. Um, and uh, so um, in this context, I'd like to um, provide a quote by Bernays. Uh, so what Bernays says is that the semantics of set theory essentially transcends um, any axiomatically specified set theory. Uh, and in general, the whole of mathematics can certainly not be represented exhaustively by a formally delimited uh, theory. Mathematics as a whole is not again a structure, a mathematical object nor is isomorphic to one. Um, and um, in this context, then, Bernays raised an objection to the interpretation of the independence uh, results that we have 
uh, discussed earlier. So in a paper that has not been discussed too much, at least I haven't seen any discussion of it, except maybe in Peter Isaacson's recent paper, um, Bernays uh, argues that uh, the results of uh, Cohen uh, do not directly concern set theory itself. They merely uh, concern an axiomatization of set theory. And uh, he argues that the models that we construct uh, using the methods of Cohen are invariably, and so to speak by construction, non-standard models, like in stem in fact to the kinds of models that we get through the Skolem construction. Um, and uh, points out, of course, that the possibility of such non-standard models arises from the fact that in the axiomatizations we have a restricted uh, notion of predicate that we are allowed to substitute in the schemata. So in particular, in set theory, the separation and the replacement schemata. Um, now, this objection, the notion that the kinds of models that are constructed using um, the uh, methods of forcing in particular have been uh, taken up by Peter Kölner uh, recently. Um, and I would like to also uh, point out um, here that essentially what Kölner is, uh, is doing is he's just repeating the point that was already made by Bernays, uh, although he is um, uh, going a little more into detail when it comes to the particular methods of model construction. So, um, but it, it's, it's worthy repeating here um, that if you start uh, with a countable transitive model of ZFC, which is in fact what Cohen himself did, um, what you get is a set-sized countable model, and that is clearly non-standard. I mean, uh, it's, it's a set, so it can't be, um, so to speak, the true universe V. Um, and this is, in, this is the point that, that Berna has emphasized, but of course, uh, we can also use um, forcing with uh, complete Boolean algebra, uh, but th that gives us a class-sized model, but um, it's a Boolean-valued uh, model, so it's not even two-valued. So again, we have um, a model that is non-standard by construction, so to speak. Um, and now, uh, uh, to come back to Bernays, uh, Bernays also makes reference to uh, the result of Zermelo, that was the quasi-categoricity result of Zermelo that I uh, mentioned above. Um, however, he not like uh, Kreisel uh, is emphasizing the second order nature uh, of the axioms of Zermelo, but the fact that um, the schemata of selection and replacement um, should be applicable to an unrestricted notion of predicate. So what he's doing is he's not saying we should um, introduce second order quantifiers, what he's saying is that we should simply allow to apply these schemata to an arbitrary extension of the language, um, which is different, arguably, from um, using second order quantifiers. Uh, for one, because we do not have to, in advance, fix the range of those second order quantifiers. And more importantly, perhaps, because it corresponds to the um, kind of open-endedness that Bernays emphasizes in his philosophy. And I will um, go into these points in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, so just to make this a bit more precise, um, if we take as an example the um, schema of replacement, um, the way it is uh, presented, say, in um, Thomas Yech's uh, set theory, um, is uh, that we have an infinite list of um, axioms that we get by substituting for phi um, the uh, sentences from, from first order set theory. Um, but if we now um, allow substitution not only of uh, formulas from uh, first order set theory, but from an arbitrary, from any arbitrary language expansion, um, and this has been made precise by uh, Fefermann and then picked up by Lev Levine, but in fact it has, it's already there in their eyes. Um, then we also get the quasi categoricity result. So we do not have to make use of second order quantifiers. All we need is uh, we have to allow for arbitrary language, uh, language expansions. Um, and that has two main advantages. The first one is that we get a kind of unitary account 
of the Axiom Schema term. And what I mean by this is the following. What is it actually that makes us accept these axioms? I mean, insofar as we accept them, of course. Insofar as we accept them, presumably it is not a case-by-case -case acceptance, but it is the fact that we see that the axiom schema of replacement makes sense. And it doesn't really matter what formula we substitute here. I mean, it's just the idea that if we have a function uh, from uh, then the, the range of a function applied to a set is itself a set. And um, how that function is defined, that is completely arbitrary. I mean, it's, it's not relevant whether we uh, do this in language or set theory or in some other language expansion. Um, and the second point is that it corresponds to what Bernays has uh, emphasized a lot, the open-endedness of mathematical concept formation. So um, I have here another quote of Bernays that uh, was made in the context of Scholem's paradox, but it applies here. And it reads as follows. Uh, this is my translation of it. Uh, mathematical thought as a matter of principle transcends any formal system. Mathematical concept formation has in constructive proceeding as well as a type theory, and also in the sequence of ascending systems of axiomatic set theory, as it's framed the open informal second number class, which can no longer be considered a determinate mathematical structure. So this echoes the point that we discussed earlier. And uh, as opposed to the openness of the number sequence, so the natural numbers are meant here, which is merely that of the incompleteness of iterating one and the same process, that of the second number class is the incompleteness of concept formation. So the idea is here again that um, being uh, essentially open, uh, we, we ought to be allowed to add as our substitution instances for the axiom schemata any, uh, any formula whatsoever. And um, maybe just to make uh, a, a historical remark, uh, this also echoes Gödel's um, emphasis on the true ground of the incompleteness phenomenon being essentially that uh, we, we, we are capable for any formal system of uh, adding or adjoining uh, types and doing this transfinitely often. Um, so uh, now I also have a few remarks on um, attempts at actually exploiting this uh, result. So I, I would argue that uh, Bernays has a, a rather interesting point here. I'm not entirely sure if it really um, gets us all the way, but at least it seems to me um, that we have here an interesting account worthy of consideration for the determinacy of the continuum hypothesis. But what Bernays also points out, of course, is that that in itself doesn't give us any handle on how to solve the continuum hypothesis one way or the, uh, the other way. Um, so uh, I also have a few remarks on uh, various attempts at solving it. Uh, one that I find rather interesting, although it does not actually work in the end, sadly, is uh, William Tate's approach, um, which also makes essential use of the idea of uh, the open-endedness of concept formation, uh, where he generalizes the set theoretic reflection principles by um, allowing, um, well, he works in the second order framework, but we could also do this in the schematic framework, arguably. Um, where he allows uh, formulas with uh, higher parameters. And uh, th this would require another talk, but um, he makes a rather interesting um, connection also to back to Zemelo's 1930s paper, uh, arguing essentially along similar lines as Bernays. Um, now, there are a few uh, problems with this. The first one is that, uh, as Schindler showed in the 1990s, um, already pi 1 1 reflection implies non predicative classes. Um, and Schindler argues that those ought to be rejected on philosophical grounds because essentially that just means that, uh, well, non predicative classes um, would, uh, uh, how should I say that? Um, so, so um, I, I don't know his first name, but Reinhardt argued against those uh, on the grounds that essentially. If you allow non-predicative classes, it just looks like you didn't finish uh, the, 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 the cumulative hierarchy. You're just adding another la layer of um, um, in the hierarchy, which, which ought to be considered as a set again. Um, but th this would also require further discussion, I, uh, I admit. 
And the, the second point is, of course, that uh, Kölner showed, showed in 2009 uh, that all the reflection principles that Tate proposed uh, are insufficient to get anywhere close to the continuum hypothesis. So um, the, this particular approach doesn't work. Um, and then there is, of course, uh, uh, the debate about um, what kinds of justifications one can provide for um, sort of extensions of set theory. Um, the kind of um, extensions that Tate is uh, proposing would all arguably fall under the heading of intrinsically justified extensions. Uh, that is to say, um, they, would, uh, they could be considered as necessary conceptual implications of the concept of set, uh, as in particular was discussed in Gödel's famous uh, paper on Cantor's uh, continuum hypothesis. Um, but then there's, of course, also the uh, approach of uh, justifying new axioms uh, on the basis of extrinsic grounds, as Gödel called them. Um, and um, yeah. So uh, to come to an end, um, I would like to only point out one thing, and that is that um, I find it quite striking that we have in uh, Van Eyes's account um, an approach that uh, takes seriously uh, a realist picture of mathematics, while at the same time is not falling prey to a kind of naive, uh, should we say, Platonism in the sense of assuming that there exists somewhere in a platonic heaven, uh, a structure, um, but uh, develops it on the uh, sort of um, basis of our informal understanding uh, of set theory. Okay, that uh, was it.